Aiton Chorley. Um, and then Gallica was kind of the the big Lancashire squad at the time. And so there was people from all different clubs around Lancashire joined Gallica. And so I went to Gallica when I was 10. Um, and I was there till I was 13. And as Rick said, I was a 100 and 200 fly swimmer. Um, I made my first nationals when I was 11. Um, and I came third in the 100 fly um, in the 11 year age group, obviously. And then I think I came fifth in the 200 fly. And then when I was 12 and 13, I still made finals in, in both events, but didn't medal again um, at that age. And then it was kind of when I was 13, it was like a weird, it was kind of things were going relatively well. And I was obviously making national finals, but it was just difficult to, I think I didn't really know, have the motivation or I kind of wanted to do other sports and I didn't really want to just focus on swimming because I had done other sports when I was younger that I really enjoyed and I found like the pressure quite quite hard to deal with um, and I just wasn't really enjoying training at the time so I decided that I was going to take a break from competitive swimming um, so I stayed swimming at Blackburn um, and trained there like t twice a week but I didn't really compete at all until I was 17 and it was only really um, there was a coach at Blackburn who kind of encouraged me to do a little bit of competing again and I started off just with like 50 fly because I'd always known fly but obviously didn't really have the fitness to go up to 100 or 200 so kind of just stuck with the 50 fly for a while and really enjoyed racing again and I made, I qualified for the British champs um, for when I think when I was 18 I guess um, but that was kind of the year I was going into university and I'd already decided to go to Bath University which obviously has a pretty good swimming team anyway but I decided to go there because it was the best for my course my degree um, and so I kind of I wanted to be part of a team there and obviously swimming was something I'd always kind of known I was all right at so um, I kind of contacted the coach and I said I've really not been doing much training but these are my times I've done a few races over the past year would I be able to join your squad and um, he was really great in kind of easing me into it again um, and at the time the bath pool was actually being redone so we were at the time we were just in a little school pool um, and so I was only actually training three times a week even when I started at Bath University um, and I was just gradually building up my kind of fitness and training and learning to love the sport again and my first year at Bath I think I came sixth in the 53 and then I started to build up my training a bit more going to like five times a week and then six and in my second year I came second in the 53 to Fran um, and then I went on placement and that's where I started swimming at Ealing in London and so um, I did pretty well in Ealing and I progressed quite a lot and that's when I won my first British Championship title in the 53 and I also made the World University Games so that was kind of my first senior team and then um, I went back to Bath for my final year and I made uh, the Commonwealth Games team and uh, got a bronze medal in the relay and then made the European team um, that summer and then um, it was actually while I was at Ealing that my coach in America, Neil, who knew some of the coaches at Ealing, kind of contacted them and asked if I'd be interested in going out to the States to swim. And it kind of worked well for me because I didn't really have, I mean, when I started at Bath University, I didn't think I'd be swimming beyond it. So to try and swim without any real like funding or anything, um, is very difficult and I knew I'd probably have to get a full-time job and try and swim as well so when this opportunity in America came up I kind of jumped at it and um, so I went off to America in 2018 and since then I've kind of progressed really really quickly with uh, my coach Neil he's like a really great coach and he's brought me on so much and so my first year in America I came second at the NCAAs in the 100 free and fifth in the 50 free and then I came at British Champs, I won the 50 and came second in the 100 and then I made the world's team and 
um, as Rick said, came seventh in the 50 and 13th in the 100. And then um, obviously went back for my second year, which unfortunately got cut short. So NCAs were kind of cancelled about four days before we were meant to leave. So that was um, quite unfortunate because I was really hoping I could kind of take the title that year. Um, and obviously I was also hoping to make the Olympic team. So now I'm back in the UK and I'm joining the Loughborough National Centre. So obviously my, my focus now is going to be um, Olympics next year and um, yeah, training back in the UK again. So that's about it really. <laughs> It's been quite an amazing journey from from where you started off and, and having such a break as well. And I, I know that some of uh, some of the guys want to ask a little bit about that. But what what was it that brought you back into swimming? Why why did you want to get back in? And and who? Because I, I I think I actually was head coach um, at the time of Blackburn when when you started doing a little bit back um, back there at thirteen. I can't remember. I might have just left at that time. But um, who who was it who brought who brought you back into it? Uh, Lee Oral. Yeah, Lee. <laughs> Lee was great. He yeah. um, he kind of like, I guess he saw my potential, and but he didn't like push it. He he was he kind of was well aware that I wasn't really ready to really sort of do loads of times a week, and I was still enjoying doing other sports. So, but he was quite creative with my training. So even though I was doing quite limited, I was only training maybe two or three times a week, but. Uh, we'd do some boxing and he got me access to a gym so that, that was the first time I'd ever really lifted weights um was with Lee and so he was very key on like working power and everything was very sprint based so mm. although I was only swimming a few times a week you can actually get a lot as a sprinter from just a couple times a week so um and he kind of encouraged me to just see what kind of time I could do and it turned out I could qualify for British champs and then that kind of just like uh, propelled it forward really. Yeah great uh, and you obviously did quite a lot of other sports um, so certainly going through even, even when I think you were at Gallica you were still doing gymnastics is, is that right? Um, how, how do you think doing other sports and, and various different things has helped you get to this level? I think um, I mean, yeah, as you say, I did gymnastics and that was kind of, I think I was about 12 when I had to, obviously both gymnastics and swimming demand a lot of time. So I kind of had to choose between the two and um, I chose swimming, but I always kind of had it in the back of my mind that I wished I'd been able to keep doing gymnastics a lot longer. And I was also doing trampolining. And when I started at high school, there was a really good cheerleading team, which I wanted to join. And I was also doing cross country and athletics. Um, and when I stopped swimming, I did some biathlon. So I still had like a decent level of fitness. Um, and then I had pretty good flexibility and kind of core stability through doing gymnastics and trampolining and cheerleading. Um, so I guess when I did get back into competing, there was still quite a, a good level of like fitness and um, strength there. It was just kind of working it more specifically towards swimming once I got back in. Yeah, great. Okay, so we'll, we'll open it up. Um, I think the best way, because I've got two pages here. So if you've got a question, if you could just type um, your name or something in the chat box and then I know, I know to come to you then. Um, does anyone have a, a question to start off? Okay, so we'll start with start with Jude. Um, I'll unmute you, Jude, and uh, and then if you want to, if you want to ask, yeah. So, what would you say is the main difference between UK and American universities? Um, there's definitely quite a big difference between the two because obviously in UK universities, I feel like the sport and the academics are quite separate, and they obviously. I mean, some universities do do some sort of sports scholarship, but it's it's you know nothing compared to what what they offer you in America, and it's kind of. I mean, I always found it was okay with um, my teachers and lecturers in terms of I had to ask for time off uh, for competitions and things. But I know not all. But I did sports science, so I think my lecturers were quite understanding about that. I don't know 
sometimes difficult to know if everyone would be so understanding because often I think in UK universities like the academics are kind of seen that they should always be put first over sport which obviously you want a good balance really but in um in America because you often I think pretty much everyone at an American university is on some sort of scholarship whether it's academic or a sports scholarship and you're kind of tied due to the scholarship you're tied into like competitions and travel and things and that's kind of all understood by um the university as a whole so there's much more like cohesion between academics and your sport and obviously because they just have so much money over there they make all their money from American football and so all that gets pumped into the smaller sports and so um they kind of are able to pay for a lot more things than um UK universities can yeah I'd say just the finances is, is just way bigger over there what what's yeah, the you. what's the culture like um at an american university um it's quite strange actually because like at university in bath a lot of my friends i mean obviously i had all the swimming friends but a lot of my friends were also non-swimmers and i lived with non-swimmers and um i kind of kept the two very separate i had like my social friends and everything and then I had my swimming friends whereas in the US, if you're a student athlete, you're kind of segregated a little bit from the rest of the student population. So we had our own nutrition center. So it's only student athletes could eat in this nutrition center. And so you didn't really get to like socialize with kind of non-athletes. And we had a, st a separate study center as well. Um, so I found that quite strange having always mixed with athletes and non-athletes to kind of just be restricted to just athletes. Um, I think they just, in a way, it's good because you had all this extra facility and support just for athletes, but also it was quite strange to me to not really feel like I was part of the student body. Yeah, um, I, think I, was, I think it would be a good um, point just to share the video um, of the relay that you did. We'll, we'll we're going to show you two videos. We're going to show you this one and then uh, Anna's swim at the World Championships. Um, I think it's just a good, a good way of getting to sort of see the culture in America and the way that, you know, they do competitions and obviously the swim is phenomenal and you'll get to see that. But also just look at the way that the crowd is, the teams are around. Um, I think it's really, really cool. So I'll just let me just quickly bring that up. Uh, I've got quite a few questions coming in. So I believe, uh, Anna, you're in the second lane from the bottom. Is that right? Uh, uh, it's either the... Yeah, maybe lane... Either the bottom lane or the one up. I can't quite remember. Yeah, I think I think from from the article it said second lane from the bottom, and you and you yeah. swim second in this relay, I think. Yeah. So it's the same here. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, second lane. Up. So I think this, this is Anna about to dive in now. Can you hear the sound, by the way? No. Does the sound doesn't come up. Let me... I think if you go on, like, viewing options or sharing options, you can share your speaker or microphone or, I don't know, something. Yeah, I'll just have a... Let me just have a quick look. Um... Advanced... Um, 
share computer sound, that's it. So Anna's just about to dive in in lane two from uh, the bottom here. <laughs> arena league gets noisy i think that's uh <laughs> that that's definitely a good a good level above arena league which is amazing but again like i don't know if you saw well, hopefully you saw the uh, the second leg there and how much uh, anna caught back on that second leg particularly the the underwater phases and the turn phases they were ph phenomenal um right let's go to a few questions um so um zahid do you want to do you want to ask your question um, which was your first swimming club that you swam for? Um, I started at Chorley Marlins. I um, don't know if you guys would know that. It's quite quite far up north. But um, yeah, I swam there. And then when I joined Gallica, I kind of transferred to Blackburn after that. Cool. Um, Marco and Isla. Uh, so, how is the specifically the training like in America? Um, I would say that it's what I've kind of gained from being out there was that we did a lot more technical work and a lot of work on underwaters and quite like we would spend kind of afternoon sessions on just drills, skills, and start. Um, and I think they kind of emphasise that a lot more over there just because when it's short course yards, you're obviously doing a lot of turns and underwaters and almost, it's almost like you spend more time underwater than you do swimming sometimes. So um, I think that's quite a big part of training that changed for me. And then um, I was doing a lot of very power-based training. We did a lot of kind of tethers and racks um, and like doing like slams into a 25 fast and so it's all like very speedy and power based which which i really enjoyed it was um when i when i was speaking to neil the, the other week he was saying that um your practices are quite um quite different each day but you also still do a decent amount of meterage and building up your aerobic capacity as well for the 100 yeah i think the only way I could, could describe like his kind of training is that like we would do something fast every single day even if it was just a few 25s but we would build in a lot of long recovery between that um which would obviously up the volume quite a lot and then we'd have days which were obviously like longest like race pace stuff which was obviously the really tough stuff for the hundred um but yeah consider like I think I was doing quite a high volume for being a sprinter but it's not like it was always hard and that just meant that I was able to recover quite well for each day so we were able to do something really high quality every single day. Cool. Okay, uh, Kai Ogden. Yeah, so just with all the ups and downs and stuff, we're just wondering how now you're back in the pool, how do you stay motivated? Um. I think I'm trying to see it as a positive in a way because 
although I was in a really good place this year and obviously going into British champs and hoping to make the Olympic team, I think um, I did a time trial in Loughborough and that kind of like showed how well I was doing and how potentially well I could have gone at champs. And um, But I think given the improvement I have been getting over the past few years, I've got another year now to improve even further and hopefully be in an even better place going into the Olympics next year. So although it's frustrating at the minute not to be in a pool and not to be competing, I'm just trying to, I guess like Mel always says to me, like you've got to do everyone, everyone's in the same situation. It's just about who kind of deals with it best um, is going to be the one that kind of comes out the other side better and is able to get back into training and racing more quickly. So I'm just trying to do this best really. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a really good point. Cause like, I, I know that, um, a lot, a lot of the swimmers sort of get into this stage now. Like they've been really, really good at, at doing their programs and, and training. And I suppose it's difficult now because we're still not really seeing what the the end is like. Um, do you have any advice on on sort of how to sort of keep that motivation going um, for those that perhaps are struggling a little bit? I think what I've been trying to do is just. I mean, you have to just take each day at a time, and obviously you have your program and whatever you've been told to try and get in each day. And I think it's just about getting like the little wins. So um, even if it's, if you're doing some like strength based stuff and just trying to do an extra push up that you could do the other day, or just like setting really like small short term goals that you can aim for each day rather than looking ahead, because obviously none of us really know what's ahead and we don't know what our next competition will be which is obviously quite strange for swimmers because we always have a competition that we're aiming for next. There's always like the next thing to be swimming towards, whereas at the minute we obviously don't have that. So you've kind of got to set yourself different goals and different aims. And yeah, that's what, the way I've been doing it is just setting kind of little goals for each day, really. And obviously some days you just really, it's really, really hard and that's okay. Um, if some days you're really, really struggling, it's okay just to accept that, you are just struggling that day and even just getting in a workout when you really don't want to is is a small win so um yeah definitely all right uh jago got a question would you ever consider joining an isl team yeah i'm hoping to join one um this year obviously we don't know if it's actually going to be going ahead or not but um I think for me, because I've been, being in America, we would race a lot. We would race kind of sometimes every single weekend, every other weekend sometimes. And so that's maybe sometimes something we don't get as much in Britain. So definitely the ISL would give me that kind of intense racing um, that I kind of needed in the, in the States. So I'm hoping to. You got, you got any uh, clues on what team yet? Or, or do we have to guess? Uh, well, I mean, obviously the Mel connection is, it would yeah. be the London Raw, uh, but nothing's been like confirmed yet. So uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. I was, uh, James Gibson was on a call yesterday and he was hinting that it's definitely going to go ahead. Um, <laughs> and it's just going to be a, a very busy, a very busy year next year. But yeah. But it's never difficult know. to know because obviously like, can we even travel anywhere this year? And it's just, you know, so yeah, just like taking it a little bit of time, I think with the ISL. Yeah. Cool. All right. Who have we got next? Um, okay. Um, Matilda, do you want to ask your question? Um, do you like swimming in the lakes or the sea? Um, or do you just like swimming in swimming pools? I, yeah, I'm not very good at swimming in, in the sea or lake. So I'm kind of, I've never really been a fan of open water or even like going on holiday in the sea. Like I'll go like to the shallow bits, but I'm just, it's just like not knowing what's underneath you. And I love being in the pool where it's so like clear and clean and you can see the bottom and you see that black line and you're just following it up and down. and. I like 
whenever I've swum in a lake, I like go so far off on the wrong direction that it's just not for me. <laughs> quite quite a contrast being a 1500 freestyle to doing a, an open water marathon swim. I did consider trying to find a lake around here before I got the swim spa, but I don't think I could have hacked it. <laughs> Yeah, you've been you've been quite lucky, haven't you? That you've got um, one of the the swimming pools set up in your your garden now. That Loughborough, was it, did Loughborough provide that? Well, so it was a kind of a connection between Ed, who's a swimmer at Loughborough, and Mel, and then um, Ed's been kind of working with a guy that has all these swim spas because he kind of does like one to one coaching, and he works with Adam's um, swim camp thing um so there was that connection and they basically had these swim spas in a storeroom and the shop was obviously being closed because of lockdown and they just thought why don't we put these to use um and so luckily for me I guess because of the Loughborough connection and they also just offered them to kind of I guess they had a list of people who could potentially get one and some people said no because they didn't have space and things and so I was lucky to kind of be asked and Obviously, I, I definitely wanted one. So, mm -hmm. cool. Um, Ilias, do you want to ask your question? So he's he's in a class, so he asked me to ask. All right, okay. For, for him, should I? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go go for it. So, yeah, Ilias wanted to know um, <laughs> if your kick has always been good. Or have you actually managed to improve it? Um, what, like my underwaters? Underwater, flutter kick, just kick in general, I think. Um, I think it seems to be always been something that I've just been, rel like in terms of the flutter kick, I've been relatively good at. I remember when I first started swimming at Bath and I didn't have like a I was sort of just starting to get back into competition and people were already commenting on my kick even then but the underwater is definitely something that I've improved a lot on being in America just because of the amount of emphasis they put on turns and underwaters um, and Neil would I don't know if you use tempo trainers but um, he used it for like my kick tempo rather than my stroke tempo um, and so he'd put it kind of a really high tempo and I'd have to kind of keep up with that when I was doing my underwaters so um, that was something we kind of really put emphasis on and I think it's really paid off. Yeah. We we do we do use tempo trainers a little bit. We don't always like using them, but um it shows shows that they do work. Um I think in terms of especially you look at um sprint freestyle and especially over the hundred, the importance of having a really strong leg leg kick, especially down that last 25 of the race um you, you know you look at you look at you know cer certainly on a world level how how important the kick is um d did you do a lot of actual kick training as well as underwater training yeah we would always have an element of kick um in our sets and we do like resistance stuff with um like with the racks or bungees or with a sponge and we do a lot of that um but that's kind of something I've trying to been working on because I think because my kick is pretty strong I almost go to my legs too early on 100 and die off mm. at the end so that's something I've had to kind of hold back like on the first 50 and then really bring in my legs and build through the last 50 so obviously on 100 you want to be the person that finishes strongest so that's kind of what I've been working on yeah definitely um right who else we got um i was working down the list um isabel eily hi um would you recommend a american university or a british one like swim team included um i think it's completely dependent on the individual and also the kind of team in either one I think for me obviously I went to Bath University as an undergrad and I don't think if I'd gone to an American university at that age I would have 
done so well I think because I was still building into my swimming and in America they do have quite strict guidelines about training hours and um, commitments and like you, you do have to be kind of very committed to stick into their kind of strict guidelines which I guess when I was just starting to get into the sport again I did quite enjoy just gradually getting back into it and enjoying it again um, and I think also depends on the American university but if it's an American coach who doesn't understand the British system sometimes they're not that good at allowing their swimmers to go back for important British meets or they're not very good at emphasizing like if you want to taper for the British champs but the NCAAs is three weeks before that they want to emphasize and focus on the NCAAs whereas I went Neil is a British um a British Olympian and so he understands like the commitments in Britain and although I wanted to swim well at NCAAs my focus was always British camps and tapering for that and then obviously worlds and stuff so um I think that's really important if anyone's considering going to America um to make sure that your coach understands that you do want to come back for British competitions if you do um and make sure that's kind of like understood between the two of you um but it's definitely a good way to get really like good support um definitely financially to be out there and to be able to swim and study so yeah depends really i think that's a really good point is i know that a few of you are actually speaking to college coaches at the moment and i think that's got to be one of your main questions is you know will they prioritize ncaa's over you know perhaps a domestic competition that you need to come back to in the uk you know you've got to make sure that they're aware of you know what what your commitments will be and you, you know you might go over there and say well i'd actually rather be uh, I'd rather focus on the NCAAs. I'm not too worried about coming back. You know, some of you might be completely different. So <clears throat> they're the sort of questions that you've got to ask. Um, let's go on to the next one. Um, so carrying on on the same sort of theme, uh, Kai Marriott. You there, Mario? Oh, do you like prefer training and racing in meters or yards um i think yards is a lot of fun um and i guess i i see it as like fun and that's kind of my fun racing but obviously long course is always my focus so i've kind of i don't know if it's just like mentally i just tell myself long course is um my favorite because it has to be because I have to swim fast long course but um I'd say swimming yards is maybe more enjoyable but I don't know it's a difficult one I think I've got to say long course because that's kind of the priority but short course yards is kind of fun hmm. awesome did you ever train at Bank A by the way do you remember Bank A in Blackburn yeah <laughs> yeah wasn't that 20 meters yeah that that was like a really small horrible little pool that we used to train in but it was amazing for working your turns yeah <laughs> um right let's go to Aoife is there a lot of pressure to perform well in America um I guess there is I think especially because you're obviously in every competition you're earning points for your team so um even like getting third over fourth or fourth over fifth is kind of really important for the team because sometimes it does come down i remember one time we were against missouri and we beat them by one point and that was like a huge deal mm -hmm. and so someone even just beating one person was a huge deal and so there is kind of a lot of pressure to swim well, but also there's pressure on everyone. So, um, but also I've never felt like I'd kind of, I, there was too much pressure. Like I enjoyed the pressure and I liked kind of going into a competition like ranked first or second. And um, I just like, even if I didn't do as well as I hoped for, you know, the team, the team's always behind you because there's such like a, 
a big team atmosphere in the States. Like that's just a huge deal. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of, I've kind of got used to the pressure, I guess. Very good. Um, right, Amber and Marissa. Okay. What are you most proud of in your swimming career? Um, I'd say making the final at Worlds last year. Um, just because I don't, I wasn't expecting to drop so much time from British champs to Worlds, um, and so, and also, my heat swim in the fifty was not good at all, and so. I would like I dived in and my hands came apart and I was just kind of freaking out for the whole whole length just hoping that I'd done enough to get into the semi-final because I didn't want to like end my worlds not doing my best performance so in the semi-final when I did such a big PB and kind of made the final I just felt like I'd really like done myself justice and um kind of done the time that I'd been training for so um yeah I think that goes back to what you were saying before about Neil made made you focus on 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 the well on you said you said on the worlds and, and British champs and and sort of didn't rest you through NCAAs. You you went all the way through that. You almost I think did you did you go through British champs as well without really resting that much? And then it was difficult for me because we were tapering fully for British champs, but because I'd had I had SECs which was a conference meet and then three weeks and then NCAs and then three weeks and then British champs. So I was kind of like trying to swim well at all of them and then have yeah. my best performance at British champs. And so although I was fully like, I did a reasonable taper for British champs, I was just tired from like trying to peak at so many competitions without fully tapering. And so I think going into Worlds, that was the first time I'd really just had a decent amount of rest and space and so I just felt so good at Worlds and I hadn't really had that the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, right, let's go to Marie. Um, when did you realise you wanted to take swimming far? Um, I think, I mean, it's difficult because when I got back into it, it all, it was such like, I never really expected to get anywhere with it and I was just enjoying racing again and seeing where I could go with it and then I guess it wasn't until probably when I was at Ealing and I won the British champs and then made my first team was when I kind of started to realise I could potentially take it a bit further but I think even then that was the, oh, that was the first time especially when Neil got in contact about America that was the first time I'd really considered taking it beyond just swimming at Bath and kind of thinking about where I was going to train after Bath, which that was kind of the turning point, I guess, is like, okay, I really want to continue this and take it seriously. And, and I was lucky that America came up because I don't know how I would have trained as seriously um, with a job as well. I think it goes to show as well that, you know, you, a lot of you worry about, you know, at 15, 16, about where your swimming career is going to go. And, you know, I think Anna's a great example of, you know, you don't need to be worrying about it at that sort of age. You've got so many, so many opportunities and so many things ahead of you, you know, and, you know, you, you could suddenly really start enjoying your swimming. Um, you know, you could be enjoying it now, enjoying it at a young age, but you don't need to be putting that pressure on yourself, you know, and you could get to university and, you know, the opportunities will just, just come at you because you're enjoying it and it's a different environment and it's, you know, it's a different group and, you know, you're suddenly not having to juggle travel and, 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 um, all of your, uh, you know, you're still going to have to study, but not as perhaps not as much, or it's going to be a more managed timetable. Um, I just think it's a great example of, you know, get, get through these, you know, sometimes quite difficult years of, um, you know, swimming at school, you know, because there are so many more opportunities ahead of you. I don't know if you agree, but. Um... Yeah, I think I, I think I did so well because I wasn't looking too far ahead and I was just snapping up any opportunity that came my way. And obviously like when I went on placement, 
in my third year and ended up at Ealing that wasn't like I wasn't seeking out a really good club or anything I just happened I went for the placement first like that was the placement I wanted and then it was like okay where shall I swim and luckily Ealing was there and Dave was great and everything and so and obviously then America came about through Ealing so it's kind of just like I didn't really plan any of it to be honest Right, let's go to um, Isla Silva. You there, Isla? Where are you? I think she's gone. Never mind. Um, right, let's go to um, let's go to Isla and Marco. You have got, you've got another question. Uh, how do you prepare psychologically for a big event? Um, I'm, I quite like to be as relaxed as possible before like a big race. And I try not to think too much about the outcome. So I think if you think too hard about the time you're going to do or the place you're going to come, it just kind of, you forget almost all your technical and process stuff you've been working on so I kind of just try and focus on the first part of my race um so just like the dive my underwater and my breakout and that's kind of just all I think about really and I feel like if I nail that bit then the rest of the race will just come naturally because obviously I've done it so many times so um it's different for the 50 and the 100. I think for the 50, I definitely just try and think about that first bit. And then for the 100, I have to be really careful not to go out too hard. And just so staying relaxed is really important for me because if I kind of go out all, all guns blazing and then have nothing left at the end, obviously you're not going to end up with a good time. So yeah, I think I try and focus more about like the small elements of the race rather than the overall outcome. Very good. Uh, I'm going to ask this question from Isla because we're recording it and she can see it back anyway because it's quite quite a good question. Um, so looking back, do you wish that you had stayed in swimming or do you think that stopping uh, and then coming back into it later on was the best thing for you? I think I think I needed that break because I don't think I think if I just kept pushing on and trying to enjoy it and because like even at, at 13 like if I'd carried on beyond that summer, I would have had to go up from seven to nine sessions. And so it wouldn't have really helped matters, I don't think. It wouldn't have made me enjoy it more. And so I think I needed the break, like psychologically and physically as well. Um, and I never really thought when I stopped that I was going to get back into it. So um, I think the fact that it just kind of happened so naturally has meant that everything's kind of been on my terms. So I've enjoyed it a lot more. Um, but I don't think I'd still be swimming now if I'd carried on a few more years, um, at that age. Yeah. Do you think you missed out on anything during that time in terms of what you could have picked up or built through them, the major new years? I don't know, really. I think, I guess... I mean, I get it's weird not to have like done any real like junior like time. Like I've never been on a junior team. I've never had like that natural kind of progression through the teens or through the ranks or anything, which is quite strange. I kind of just popped up out of nowhere. Um, so I don't know. It's a difficult one. I think being in so many other sports, I think if I'd done no sports during my break, I wouldn't have been able to get back to it like I did. But I've always been kind of well conditioned and had a decent level of fitness so um I don't yeah. know It'd be interesting to know <laughs> yeah I think I think that's key as well that you, you're doing other sports and different things during that time so you could you meant that you could get back into it um right I'm gonna go I'm just gonna ask some questions we'll get go, go through some questions of people who haven't asked yet now there's one that's um relatively similar to another so I'll, I'll get sky to ask it um you there sky yeah um what would you say your favorite like po like before or after racing food is 
Um, I don't. I guess. Yeah, I don't. I don't like to eat too much before. So I guess after. I don't know, like chocolate milk or something, probably. Chocolate milk is a good recovery <laughs> drink, isn't it? It's like quick and tasty. Yeah. Um, the, so someone else asked, so Amber asked about what your diet is like. Um, I try and I try not to overthink about like the amount I'm eating um, in terms of like calories or anything. I think it's not great to, worry, especially when you're training so much, it's often like eating enough is kind of the issue. Um, but I just try and like focus on eating three kind of decent meals a day and then just having healthy snacks between rather than kind of picking here and there of like little bits and mobs and then you end up kind of losing track of what you've actually eaten so um I actually eat predominantly vegetarian I do eat fish as well but um so I guess because of that my diet is pretty healthy really cool Okay, um, let's go to um, Jude. Do you want to do you want to ask yours again? Yeah. So, what would you say is the hardest, like the hardest part of your career before lockdown happens? Um, I'd say probably so. The year before I went to America. Although I obviously make, I made Commonwealth Games and I made Europeans, but that was a year where I did plateau a little bit. And I guess before that, because I'd been improving so quickly, it was like a bit frustrating for me. Not really like I did a good time to qualify for Commonwealth Games, but then at Commonwealth Games and at Europeans, I wanted to kind of do the best performance of the year at one of those and although I wasn't far off my PB I didn't do a PB and that was kind of just frustrating for me because I wanted to show that I could perform when it mattered and although like the times went awful I just like didn't feel like I really got the best out of my performance um so I was kind of a little frustrated and I was starting to think like oh is, is this as good as I'm gonna get and um and obviously that's when I then went off to America and obviously it all took off again. So that was quite a, just a frustrating period, I guess. And sorry, how, how did you like handle that when it was happening? Um, I mean, at Commonwealth Games, because it was still like one of my first major competitions and I made finals. So I still, and I progressed through the rounds, although my times weren't like, PBs they were pretty close and I also did a really good time in the relay that we got a medal in so I kind of took the positives from that and although I wasn't like totally happy with all my performances I kind of took the positives from the ones I was happy with um but then I did struggle quite a lot at Europeans that year because my times were kind of worse than they'd been at Commonwealth Games and I just like that was my first British team uh, obviously Commonwealth Games was was England so I kind of felt like I had something to prove that I should be there and things so I guess I struggled a bit with that one but because I was I had a change coming up and I was going to the states and things I just kind of like was looking forward and kind of thinking like okay we'll put this year to bed like I've had two good like I've made two teams which is a big deal anyway and I've still a lot to learn so I might not have necessarily done really good times but it's all good experience to kind of be in that situation obviously I can use that for the future. Very good right we've we've had a few questions about um, lockdown and about Covid so I'll um, we'll, we'll group them together so uh, Zahid do you want to ask your question and then we'll see if we can expand on it a little bit. Uh, this one's uh, from Mariam. Mariam. So, what exercises do you do to keep your swimming technique at a good level do you, during lockdown? Um, we're doing a lot of shoulder work with bands. So I think it's really important to keep that level of work through your shoulders. Because obviously we do a lot um, 
when we're swimming without even realizing how much work's going through our shoulders and so you don't want to get back into the pool having done nothing um and obviously be at risk of injury and things so because especially a lot of the cardio stuff you can do which isn't in the pool is all kind of leg based like you've got your cycling and your running it's difficult to really do much cardio through your arms so um there's loads of good like capacity um shoulder stuff you can do with bands um you just need to like attach a band to a door and you can do like you know rows or like extensions or pullbacks all that kind of stuff we've been doing loads of that that's great and um jago you, you you well you're actually doing a bit of a survey on this so jago's doing something for school so i'll uh, i'll let you ask your question on on the same sort of thing yeah i was just wondering how through this kind of pandemic and the lockdown your like training schedule has been affected um it's obviously different like forms of training but um we've tried to keep it as similar as possible in terms of the hours we spend training and the kind of training we're doing so every morning we'll do like a group zoom and the physio will run like stretching and capacity stuff with the bands which I was talking about and we'll do like some core work and then which I guess is similar to like pre-pool type stuff and then um we'll often do like a couple hours of cardio a day and obviously I've got the pool now so I'll be doing like an hour and a half um in the pool as well as maybe an hour on the bike or a run or something and then we're still doing gym three times a week um, and I've managed to get like some weights and stuff. So we've obviously had to alter um, some of the exercises just because we don't have the right equipment. But generally, we've tried to stick to similar times we would when we're actually training, just to try and normalise it a little bit. It's still quite a full on program that you've got. Yeah, I was adding up the hours and I think it's, it's probably about I think about 15 hours of kind of cardio stuff a week, which is obviously usually just swimming, but now it's yeah. a bit of swimming, running, biking. And then obviously there's gym three times a week and a little bit of like rehabby stuff too. So yeah, it's quite, quite full on still. Yeah. And are you spending any time during this time just allowing yourself to unwind and, and switch off a little bit? Yeah, I'm trying to, I've just, I graduated at the weekend from um, my master's so I guess this is the first time I've really had time to just do nothing or watch Netflix and stuff which I'm actually quite enjoying and I think it's good when you've got you work quite hard in the morning and then you've got maybe a session in the afternoon and just take that time in between to really just chill out and you feel like you've deserved it and then obviously also in the evenings if you've just done a session you feel like you deserve that time to relax because if you if you have a day where you do nothing and you just spend the whole day kind of sitting around you kind of feel a bit guilty about it so i'm enjoying being able to relax and not feel guilty about it that's great um right we'll we'll make these the last few questions so um marissa do you want to ask yours who inspires you and why who inspires me um because a lot of people inspire me um it's quite strange having like come into the sport quite late and kind of go up the ranks quite quickly um because i've kind of people who like inspired me i'm now kind of on teams with which is quite strange um obviously like fran halsall was always i always kind of looked up to her as like she was the best like british female sprinter and I always wanted to do what she could do um and unfortunately I never really got I got to race her once at British Champs and obviously came second to her so and then she retired so I would have liked to race her a bit more um would have been cool to go against her now um but I guess people like Simone and Kate Campbell and Peniel Bloom um they're kind of people I've always seen as like the top sprinters in the world and always like looked up to and tried to like especially Peniel because she's small and so she probably has quite a similar straight to me um 
a lot of other sprinters are obviously quite tall so um I've always tried to kind of replicate her stroke and then a European short course I actually beat her in in the 100 free which was it's really strange to look up to someone and then manage to beat them in a race um so yeah very good um and Ivy can ask your question how did you manage school and swimming <laughs> um I had to be quite good with my time and well organized and I always kind of tried to make some sort of schedule um and assign time to like getting work done and try and stick to it because obviously you know what competitions you have coming up um, and you know when exams are due and it might be that some of those clash so if you know you've got an exam kind of around the same time as the competition then obviously it's important to make sure you get that done um, or get an assignment get the assignment done before the competition so um, there's obviously times when it's really difficult and when I was at Commonwealth Games that was actually like my final year at Bath and I had my dissertation due and final exams and things so I had to work with a lot of my teachers to get them to allow extensions and things but I was still studying while I was out there which isn't necessarily ideal when you're trying to focus on competing but just being like smart with your time really. Absolutely um right Kai you've got another one or is it Mika? It's me, Kat. Uh, it's me. Uh, how important is it to you to have like someone that you're training with, like a training partner or something, where can you kind of work like by yourself? Um, I think I definitely need, I like having training partners, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like someone I'm racing against or someone who does the same event as me. It's more just like having people to motivate you and, um, obviously see them working hard and you want to work harder kind of thing because like I mean I had a lot of teammates in America there was like 25 girls um on the team but we we're all kind of quite different speeds but we were still able to push each other quite hard so although it wasn't necessarily like someone to race I don't I don't feel like I need that because I feel like I'm motivated enough to kind of like work as hard as I need to in a session or whatever but it's just I, I couldn't just do it on my own like it's quite hard during lockdown just motivating myself to just train on my own it's, it's quite difficult yeah I think I think that's um that's a really good question because I know that um you know I, all, all all swimmers are different some people like to stand up and race their teammates some people just like to race on their own some groups we've not got people where they can really race each other and I think that's that's a really good question um from coaching chats that I've been having over the last few weeks I've known that every swim every swimmer is different some people really do like to stand up and race others are, are more than happy to sort of focus on their own swimming and, and they want to know their own stroke counts or stroke rates and they are you know and, and swim it how they would swim it rather than actually stepping up and racing someone else. So I think it depends on the, on the type of swimmer that you are and, and the person you are. Um, Anna, we've, we, we are at six o'clock. We've got a few more questions. Are you okay for a little bit longer? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So Ronnie, do you want to ask your question? Um, how big of an involvement and influence have your parents had in your career? Oh, they've been like massively important. Um, I mean, obviously when I was training at Gallica and things, um, they were the ones that drove me to training. So that's, you know, they they never they never thought they were signing up to getting up at 4 a.m. and driving me to Manchester or whatever. So that's, you know, something that they just accepted and did because it's what I wanted to do. And so that I sort of um, can't really thank them enough for that. But when... I guess now I'm at a point where I'm a lot more independent and ever since I got back into training when I was 17 and I was driving it was more just like just being supportive of what I wanted to do and like they always try and travel to see me compete so like they came to Taiwan for the World University Games they came to Gold Coast for Commonwealth Games they came to South Korea so they've they've kind of 
followed me all over the world and they've obviously visited me in America as well. So probably at a lot of expense, but um, it's just because they want to support me and see me do well. So um, I definitely need them uh, with me. Nice. So if there's any parents listening, all of those early mornings, you do get to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel eventually. You get to go to some nice countries. Just drive as soon as you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and get the kids to learn how to drive. I, I know that my parents uh, made me do that as soon as I turned 17. Yeah. Um, right, uh, Matilda, you've got another question. Yeah. What would you rather do after a race? Um, what do you mean, like? Like, um, do you want to be with your friends or do you want to be, um, like, in your room or? Is it after, after race, so straight after she's finished a race at a competition, what, what do you do to sort of unwind? Yeah, is that what you mean, Matilda? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess it depends on, firstly, how well the race has gone. And also if it's the end of the competition or not. So like if it's middle of the competition, then I typically just like um, kind of swim down and get out of there as quick as I can. So I'm able to recover and refuel and stuff. And then I typically just chill in my room and watch Netflix or something and just try and relax as much as possible. Because if I've got the ra a race the next day, then sometimes it's just too much to be like trying to, talk to friends or obviously I'll see family for as, as long as I can but you kind of don't want to waste any like emotional energy really um but if it's the end of a competition obviously I'll um go like hang out with friends or see family go out for a meal or something like that so it just depends on the situation really but obviously always like the performance comes first so if I've got a race the next day then that's pr the priority really Awesome. Right. Um, so unless there's anyone else that's got any questions, we'll, we'll make this the last one with Amber and Marissa. Uh, I think it's quite a good one to finish on. Um, do you want to go for it, girls? What do you like doing apart from swimming? Um, I, I guess I like to go see friends and go shopping um, watch Netflix. Um, just like normal things really it's quite nice to meet up with friends who aren't swimmers and just kind of forget about the swimming world for a little bit just do normal stuff have you got any recommendations for netflix um i'm actually not on a series currently i've been watching that normal people on bbc we've just finished that um so i need to find a new series now but yeah. i know mel keeps wanting me to watch uh the last dance uh, the um, Michael Jordan. Yeah, that's that's next on my binge list. Yeah, it's meant to be very motivational and inspiring, so might give that a try. Amazing. Right, has anyone got any last questions? Okay, so um, well, well, we'll wrap it up there, but I just want to say a massive thank you to Anna, and I think it it's really inspiring to see, um, you know, especially as I saw you uh, as, as quite a young swimmer and, and, and seeing that journey over the last few years of, of, of where you've, where you've been and, and what you've been doing. It's, it really is inspiring. And I just want to say a massive thank you to you for, for coming on and hopefully inspiring the next generation of swimmers. So thank you very much, Anna. No, thank you. I've enjoyed uh, chatting to you all. I think it's like good for me because I feel like it would have been good for me to have this kind of thing when I was like your age and swimming. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, great stuff. Um, lots of thank yous in the chat box. If anyone does want to unmute and say thank you, you're more than welcome to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone has like really specific thank you. about America, then... Um, <laughs> you can like ask Rick to ask me or whatever because I might be able to help yeah. like in terms of applying to schools or whatever yeah that would be really good I think for a few of the guys that are looking at America in the next few years 
Um, so if you didn't catch that, if anyone wants to um, just drop me a line and I'll I'll get in contact with Anna. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. Amazing. Thank right. You. Thanks so much, Anna. And best of luck for the rest of um, lockdown and, and certainly for next year going into the Olympics. Thank you. I'll yeah, hopefully be, watch, be watching well. you on TV soon. Yeah, I hope so. Uh -huh. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.